Thanks for joining the Henry Street Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. You are certainly our honored guest, and it's our pleasure to have you in the midst of us as we continue our study of the Word of Almighty God. Of course, this is Thursday night, not our normal night for Bible study, as we typically meet every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time. But because we had issues yesterday, we postponed uh, Bible class until tonight. Uh, so we thank you for making an adjustment in your schedule. For those that have joined us here tonight, as we continue to go through the gospel according to John in this great uh, book of the Bible uh, that talks about Jesus' divinity, that talks about his death, burial, resurrection, and how he, of course, is our Lord and our Savior. And without him, we'd have no chance at eternal salvation. Uh, so again, I want to extend a cordial invitation to you, not only to join us tonight, but every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time here on Facebook Live. And of course, we do post these messages on YouTube within 24 hours. Uh, but more, most importantly, we'd like to have you in person on every Sunday with us. Uh, we meet in our church building now. Uh, most of our members are vaccinated and uh, we're getting back to normal and meeting in the church building as well. So we celebrate that awesome opportunity that God has given us to be back in the building. But we do, do, we do that is, practice social distancing and we mark off the pews where we don't sit so close to each other except for family so that we're spreading love, worshiping as a collective body, but at the same time not spreading the coronavirus. Uh, so we meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time at 309 Henry Street. The city is Gadsden, state is Alabama. 35901 is our zip code. And you can find us easily at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. Uh, with that being said, and before getting into the Word of God, one more introductory thing I want to take you through is that we want to always make you aware of our YouTube site. And of course, as I mentioned to you, every time that we meet, we actually record our sessions and we post them within 24 hours. So if I can't post it tonight, you'll see it within 24 hours. I uh, so encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and that way you'll get the notifications when our newest videos are available. And you can get to us by going to YouTube.com, of course, going to YouTube itself, typing my name, Anthony L. Norwood, or typing in Henry Street Church of Christ. You'll see my picture there and my name on YouTube being Jesus is Lord, in honor of, of course, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when you come to the uh, the page, our channel that is, you come to our front page where you see the latest videos. And of course, you'll see that there are always new videos because we do post daily. Uh, we post our midweek Bible studies every uh, Wednesday and or Thursday. And we uh, post our Sunday morning worship every Sunday. Um, but we also have a special thing that we do. It's called uh, Daily uh, one Minute Inspirations, which is our daily devotional. Um, and that's part of our playlist that we have going on YouTube. Playlist is nothing but a category. And we have over 600 videos now. So we've been doing this for about five years. And that basically means that we have to have some organizations. So we put them in playlists, called cat which are, are basically categories, uh, for you to look up whatever subject that you want. So we're just using this as a miniature video library of God's Word so that Christians can grow, Christians can be encouraged, Christians can be instructed, and Christians can also instruct others from the information that you pick up from uh, the numerous videos that we have available for our education. Um, also, again, you see these categories. I think it's 19 categories, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the One Minute Inspirations are our daily videos. They're one minute, literally, or less of God's Word to start your day with. So I try to post those early in the morning. So we have our guidance, our spiritual compass to go by, uh, to guide us throughout the day. And, of course, uh, you can share these things with others. So, again, subscribe. Encourage others to subscribe. Share and like the videos. As in doing so, you're actually helping the Word of God spread throughout the earth. And you're doing the will of Almighty God. 
All right, let's get into our studies tonight, starting with John chapter 8, verse 53 to verse number 59. As always, we use the sound method of Bible interpretation to come up with sound interpretation. That is, we uh, read the entire thought of God in a passage of Scripture. Then we go back and look at the details verse by verse or a small collection of verses so that we don't misinterpret what God is saying. Because you have to always look at the verses in the bigger picture. That is, what was God thinking when he made this one statement is connected to other statements um, right here in this passage of scripture, as well as other parts of the Bible, so that we don't misinterpret what God says and we don't, we don't believe something false, and worst of all, teach something's false. All right, so John chapter 8, verse 53 to 59, read it all the way through, starting with verse 53, and it reads, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I, say, and if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Again, that's John chapter number 8, verse 53 to verse number 55. Let's continue reading down to verse number 59. It says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Keep that under your belt. That means something. Before Abraham was, I am. All right, verse 59 says, Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So again, that was the reading of John chapter 8, verse 53 to verse number 59. All right, so let's go backwards and study these verses more in detail. Again, again, verse 53 says, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Now, in response to Jesus telling the audience that those who obey him will have eternal life, the unbelievers that he was talking to asked the Lord, does he think he is better than Abraham? So obviously this was not a question with good intentions. They were actually trying to degrade Jesus, okay? Now, since Abraham died and never received eternal life on earth, how could a man live forever is the question, really, that the unbelieving audience is asking Jesus right now. Uh, the prophets were so righteous, I, I should say it this way, let me say it right. The prophets were also righteous and never lived forever in a natural sense. So again, these are the arguments that the unbelieving people that don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, meaning their Lord and Savior, that they're putting on the plate in front of him to try to discredit him. Remember, He's talking mainly to a crowd that does not believe in him. There are some people scattered in that crowd that do believe in him, but the majority of people that he's dealing with are unbelievers, so they're making unbelieving statements, and they're trying to make statements to discredit him and make him look bad, okay? Of course, you never can make God look bad because remember, God is divine. God is above all, all of us, knows everything, and we cannot outsmart him by any form of fashion. So these questions that they're asking, they're going to be in vain because God always knows how to uh, make an argument better than they ever can make in their entire lives, even combined as a group. They could not outthink Jesus, okay? Which they're trying to do and it's going to be in vain. All right, so again, here's what they're actually arguing against Jesus. Now, Jesus' enemies are arguing. How could Jesus possibly give anyone eternal life? Now, if anyone should have lived forever is what they're arguing. It should have been righteous men like Abraham and the prophets is what they're trying to say. OK, because remember, at this point in history, Abraham and the prophets had died long before this conversation between Jesus and these unbelievers in John chapter number eight. But however, their logic is flawed, uh, of course. Uh, because they're presenting Jesus as not speaking, because in this case, let me put it this way, their logic is flawed 
because they're talking about life when it comes to the earthly body. But Jesus is talking about spiritual life. He's actually talking about eternal life because Jesus knows that all men's going to die. That's not an issue. Of course, he's going to raise us all from the dead in John chapter 5, verse 28 and verse 29, which we stated already at his second coming. So he, know, he knows that we're all going to die from a physical standpoint. And, but he also knows that he's going to raise us from the dead because he has the power to do just like to, to do just that as he did with his own self, rising himself from the dead later on in Bible history. So again, remember what we're talking about. These people that are arguing against Jesus are talking in carnal terms. They're talking in earthly terms. They're not thinking spiritual at all when Jesus is, a, Jesus is on a whole nother level of understanding and teaching right now. But remember, as we talked about, those who are not spiritual cannot pick up spiritual things. That's why they're struggling so much with what Jesus is talking to them about. But of course, again, the struggle is real because the struggle is defined by Satan. Remember, anytime there's a misunderstanding of God's word, as the parable of the seed and sower has taught us, that means Satan is somewhere in there causing confusion in the people's head, which causes doubt, which causes them not to accept Jesus as what you sing and are witnessing right now from our studies of John chapter number eight. So it's no different even today that Satan does the same things, plays these same mind tricks on people in order to get them to reject Jesus if they're not honest people to begin with. Okay, so again, the unbelievers are beginning to infer that Jesus was trying to build himself build himself up as more than just a man. Okay? Now, unfortunately, the unbelievers could not understand that Jesus was talking about spiritual eternal life. In fact, Abraham and the prophets had indeed lived on after earthly death. Now, this is something that Jesus knew that they didn't know. Okay? They didn't understand that Abraham was still alive. I don't mean by the body, but I mean by the soul. Remember, all of our souls live on even after our body dies. The soul, as we like to sing the old hymn, the soul never dies. It never does die. So Abraham and all the Jewish prophets, prophets just mean those that spoke from, uh, spoke from God. They were the preachers of the Old Testament. Uh, all of them were dead by the time that uh, Jesus was talking to this group in John chapter number eight, but they really weren't. They were dead in the body, but living in the soul. Okay, their souls, their inner essence, uh, that what they really were, the people who they really were, were still living on. So think about this. This is a very profound statement when you think about it, because remember, Abraham had been dead for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And Jesus is actually going to show us that he was still living and is a living even today, okay, in a spiritual standpoint. As we all are after we die, we live on in the soul form. And so you'll see that in Matthew chapter number 22, verse 31 to 33, which I'm going to bring to you and let you see on your own screen uh, as well. Okay, Matthew 22, let's look at that for a moment. And we'll come back to John chapter number 8. And we're going to show you that God is the God of the living, not the dead. Okay? So even if you're alive now, guess what? You belong to God. If you have passed and your soul has gone on to paradise, as we said, you, be you belong to God. Okay? And this is a whole teaching that Matthew is, is basically going to teach us right now. We look at Matthew 22, verse 31 to 33, uh, which we're going to re again review before we go back to John chapter number 8. It says... And this is Jesus speaking. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Oh, amen, somebody. Think about this. Remember all these people in Matthew 22 that are mentioned that Jesus is talking about had been dead for centuries, for hundreds of years when he made this statement. So look what God is saying. I am the God of Abraham. So if Abraham's dead in the flesh, that means he's living in the spirit. And God is still his God. Okay? Same thing with Isaac. Same thing with Jacob. Uh, God is saying, I am not the God of the dead, but of the what? Of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. They were shocked that he was saying these things because they thought Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were gone. But God was saying they still lived. 
Because why? The soul lives on. The soul always lives, including ourselves. So think about it this way. If you have lost a loved one, you have lost a mother, you have lost a father in this life, you've lost a sibling, guess what? They're still living. Huh? Well, you may be saying, well, we cremated them. They're still living. You may have been saying to yourself, well, we placed them in the ground. I saw them go in the ground in the casket. Guess what? They're still living. Because that which we are putting in the ground or that which is cremated or going to ashes is just the flesh. But the spiritual side of us lives on forever. It never dies. And that's why it, we always sing that song. And the, the soul, it never dies. Okay? All right. So same thing with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their, their bodies probably had decayed long ago. But they still lived on because God said they lived on in the spiritual, spiritual standpoint. Now, uh, again, the other accusation that the audience was lodging at Jesus was that he was making himself out to be more than what he was. And he really wasn't because he was and is the son of God and has the power to give eternal life to anyone. Remember, folks, the proof of Jesus being able to give eternal life would be the resurrection of the Lord himself later on, which happened in Bible history. You ought to be saying, thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. That my savior lives as well. He did get up out of the grave and he's living forevermore at the right hand of God. So our Savior lives. That's why our cross is empty. If you want to look at it from a symbolic standpoint, because he's no longer on the cross. He's no longer in the rich man's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. He's no longer, uh, I would call it, incarcerated by death because God has released him from it. He, he rose from the dead, walked on earth, Acts chapter number one, for about 40 days, then ascended back into heaven, Acts chapter number one, seated at the right hand of God on his own throne, at the right hand of the Father, crowned king of kings and lord of lords. So he lives on just like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and anybody else has ever lived. They're still living now, though you don't see them walking around on earth anymore. Though you may have committed their bodies to the ground and cremated them, they still live on. That's why we have to get our lives right with Christ because the soul can experience pain too. Oh, amen, somebody. So that's why we don't want to go there. Okay, that's why we want paradise to be our home and later on heaven as we know it at the uh, great judgment day, also known as the second coming to come. All right, let's continue on. Now, here's the logic. Since Jesus was able to rise from the dead himself, then certainly he would have the power to make his followers live forever. And of course, remember, they were asking him, the Jewish audience that didn't believe, was Jesus greater than Abraham? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. He is certainly greater than Abraham. Abraham was a good man, but Abraham was not the savior. Abraham was not divine like Jesus Christ. Abraham was not the son of God. Yes, Jesus is greater than any name that has ever been in the earth. He's greater than any angel that has ever lived. That's why Jesus can say in Matthew 28, verse 18, and verse number 20, specifically in verse number 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's because he's above all. He's above all in heaven, above all in earth. So he is greater than you and I, greater than the president of the United States, greater than the prime minister of um, of the UK and all countries you can think of in every continent, Africa, everywhere, Asia, everywhere. He is the greatest and will always be the greatest, including greater than Abraham, even though Abraham was a very good person. You see, again, Abraham never possessed the power to resurrect himself, and he certainly has no power to make the dead rise from the grave as Jesus will do on the judgment day, as we talked about in time gone by in John chapter 5, verse 28 and verse number 29. Now, moving on to the next verse, let's look at verse number 54. Again, in John chapter number 8, that says, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. Is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Now, Jesus shows us that it was not important for him to generate praise for himself. As you like to say, Jesus was not looking for a pat on the back from anybody else. He was not looking for congratulations or any of uh, that type of thing. He was not looking to vaunt himself up by any form of fashion. It was not important for him. You see, again, he did not need to promote himself. It was God himself who was honoring him instead. 
And of course, we know that the father, as we talked in time gone by, but I'll give you a reference point if you want to restudy it. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 15 and verse number 17, remember the voice of God himself said at Jesus' baptism in front of the Jewish people, in front of the Jewish leadership of the time, that Jesus was his son. Remember what he said in Matthew 3, verse 15 and verse number 17, said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So obviously then, you have the greatest witness of all time that uh, talked from heaven himself in God the Father, putting his stamp of approval on Jesus and showing people ahead of time that this is the son. This is the one he sent to uh, command us to be our king of king, lord of lords, as well as our lord and our savior. Okay. So obviously then uh, he's greater than Abraham. He's greater than anybody that's ever lived. And of course, he has the personal endorsement of God, the father himself. Okay. All right. So again, it was the father who was acting as a witness to Jesus being sent by him, not only through the voice that, he, that the people heard uh, back in uh, the books that we just read. In other words, the uh, baptism of Jesus. But God also was putting a stamp of approval on Jesus through the many, many miracles the Lord was able to do in the sight of the people in Acts chapter two, verse number 22. Let's look at that for a moment as well. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22, as this first gospel sermon talks about Jesus to give us even more confidence, more trust, and more faith in him as uh, the one sent from God the Father, because the Bible is going to show us that God approved of him. In other words, he demonstrated that he had sent him by the miracles, the wonders, and the signs. All the miraculous things he was able to do were further proof that God the Father had sent him as our Lord and Savior, the Almighty Son of God. It says, let me give you the exact words out of Acts 2, verse 22, which is God's word itself that can't be argued with because it came from God. It says, verse number 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. All right, let's go back to our study then. Now, we already had God's witness, right? We had God's witness through his voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism. We have God's witness also that he sent Jesus through the miracles that Jesus was empowered to do by God the Father. But also the word of God itself says that God the Father sent Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Just one example of that, of course, being John chapter 5, verse number 39. So you see God testifying about Jesus being his son several different ways. So these are all witnesses that I believe that if today this was a court of law, symbolically speaking, you had three witnesses to the truth. So there's no denial that Jesus is the son of God, our Lord and savior, uh, except if you just don't want to be honest and accept the word of God. Uh, John chapter five, verse 39 says, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. In other words, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible screams and it makes it clear that Jesus is the Messiah in Jewish terms, meaning the Son of God, our Lord and our Savior. All right, let's go to verse number 55 as we continue in John chapter number 8. I welcome our young preacher uh, here from uh, Nigerian Christian Institute and Brother Richard. Welcome, sir. It's very late for you to be with us here tonight, but we love your presence. Thank you for watching from Nigeria. But 55. Verse 55, John chapter 8, verse number 55 says, Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Now, Jesus teaches us about his relationship with the Father here. He tells us that he knew God. And of course, we know that's the truth. He had an intimate relationship with the Father. Of course, we know why that is the case as we studied when we studied John chapter number 1. He knew the father from the beginning because he existed before mankind. So remember, before there was an Adam and Eve, uh, before there was a you and I, before any people existed on the planet, Jesus already existed. According to John chapter one, verse one and verse number three and verse number 14. And of course, so that was means that he was able to witness the creation of all mankind and even more. What I mean by that, Jesus created mankind prior to his coming to the earth. 
Remember, we studied John, excuse me, Hebrews chapter one, verse one to verse three in um, very extensively over the years. But I just want to point out one thing from here. And I want you to be able to see actually two things uh, about the creation of mankind and how Jesus was involved with it. Remember verse one, Hebrews chapter one, verse one says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. So in other words, uh, before Jesus came to the earth in the flesh, God was speaking to us by the more prominent names that you know about, like Moses, like Ezekiel, um, like Isaiah, like Hezekiah and others. God was revealing his Bible, his word in the Old Testament through all these men until the until Jesus Christ became the most prominent prophet of all. Because why? He revealed the new covenant, meaning the New Testament to us, that we have to obey and believe in order to be saved. So that's why God calls him the, this time we live in the last days, meaning that he's no longer going to speak a different word from heaven. In other words, you'll get no other book outside the New Testament for your salvation. That's why we don't count on the Quran because it came 600 years after the New Testament. That's why we don't count on the Book of Mormon and all those type of things and any other things that people write today and call it the Word of God. It's not the Word of God and never will be because God tells us that in the last days he speaks to us by his son. So if these new books and all this, this new age philosophies that are coming out um, are in the forefront, you need to go ahead and put them in the trash can or burn them because they're not the Word of God. So again, verse 2 hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. That means all things are in Jesus' hands. He's over all things. Again, that just coordinates what we just were taught in Matthew 28, verse 18, that all power is given unto him in heaven and in earth. Okay, but here's what I want you to highlight in verse number two. Keep this in your mind. Now, remember, the subject is Jesus. Remember, verse two, the subject is Jesus. What did he say? Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now, here's the subject. Who did the next part? It says, by whom also he made the world. So the earth, uh, the animals, everything in it, plant life, even insects, they were made by Jesus, okay? Specifically by Jesus. Now, verse three tells you how all this could get done. Who being the brightness of his, gl of his glory and express image of his Person. In other words, Jesus is the exact carbon, we like to call it carbon copy of Jesus, not, of the Father, I mean. In other words, that's why Jesus says, if you want to see the Father, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, there's no difference between him, although they're two different people, there's no difference in all essence between God the Father and Jesus Christ, okay? That's why it says he's expressed image of his person. All right. Now, here's what I want you to highlight. Remember, in verse two, I said, highlight in your mind by whom also he made the world. So we know that Jesus made the world, uh, everything within it. OK. And it says upholding all things by the word of his power. In other words, Jesus commands from heaven that the world continues. OK. What that means is, is that everything you have is owed to Jesus specifically. For instance, the food on your table he upholds that. It means he sustains us. So everything that you he, we get, we receive, food on our table, clothes on our back, a roof over our head, etc. These are all blessings that Jesus gave us to continue to sustain the world, which we are a part of that world. And he also said, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What the Hebrew writer is talking about is permanency. What that means is, is that after he purged our sins, which means... He, he shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That means so we can be clean in God's sight. Then after he did that, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That means he rose and he sat down on his throne in heaven next to the father, which is talking about permanence, meaning that once he gave his blood, no other animals or no another anything had to be slaughtered because his blood was enough to satisfy the debt of sin that we've all accumulated in God's sight, okay? So that means that no more sacrifices need to be made or will be made for the forgiveness of man's sins. That's why Jesus is said to have what? Sat down. Sat down means to go to a portion of rest, meaning what? Your work is 
over when it came to him dying for us and giving us the new status of being saints instead of sinners in God's sight, right? Giving us the ability to now have the status of no longer being sinful in God's eyes and separated from him, but instead washed from our sins and actually the children of God. That's why he could sit down again, meaning permanence, that his work of redemption, that's what it's called, of dying for our sins was done at that time. All right, let's continue on. Now, we're talking about going back to John chapter number eight and Jesus exposing to the audience about his intimate connection, his intimate relationship with the Father. Uh, that happened before we were made. That happened when Jesus was on earth. And it still happens today that he still has this intimate relationship with the Father, a close bond that never can be broken. Okay? So again, Jesus still knows God to this day in that intimate fellowship. Because after his death, burial, and resurrection, he ascended back into heaven where he was prior to his earthly ministry. So again, he's now seated in the place of honor at the right hand of God the Father. Which you'll see again in that great gospel sermon uh, on Pentecost Day in Acts chapter number 2, verse 32 and verse number 33. Let me read that to you really quickly here and then we'll be able to move on. But Acts chapter 2, verse 32 and verse number 33, this is talking about the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ after his death on the cross of Calvary. And this is Peter, through the Holy Spirit, is teaching us this. It says, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted. So again, he's at the right hand of God. Remember, right hand in the Bible means to be in a place of honor and fellowship with the other person. So that's why when you look at Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46, at the judgment day, God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. And that just means symbolism for people on the earth. Those on the right hand, the sheep, will go on to heaven and continue to be in that favor of God forevermore. But those on the left hand, the goats, will go on to eternal punishment. So remember, it's good to be on the right hand, uh, like Christ Jesus is on the right hand of God, and we're on the right hand of God as well uh, on that judgment day if we stay faithful unto death. That means a place of honor, the place of fellowship with the one uh, that we know is God. Okay, so verse 33 again, let me read it all the way through, it says, Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, that means raised to a different status, okay, Remember, he's king of kings, lord of lords. He's no longer the suffering servant. He's been exalted, placed on high. Okay. Therefore, being the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Okay. That was talking about the gift of the Holy Ghost uh, at the time. Okay. That was put in the earth uh, for the first time. Okay. All right. Let's move on. The verse, uh, we're still in verse number 55. Let me read it one more time just to remind you. It says, Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Again, that's Jesus talking uh, in response to the doubtful questions and the evil things that the people are bringing to him that don't believe in him from the crowd that he's speaking to. All right, so remember, all of heaven and earth it's subject to the authority of Jesus Christ, as we established already in our study from Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Now, when Jesus walked on the earth, he was made into a man. Remember that in John chapter 1, verse number 14. I remember he was divine and the word was made flesh. He became a human being later on. Okay. Now, also in his human form, as an example uh, for all of us to follow, he obeyed all that the Father commanded as an example again for us to follow. Let's look at these verses here really quickly. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to verse number 2, and Romans 8, verse 29, as well as John chapter 8, verse number 29. We'll look at these a little bit more in depth for a moment. All right, let the internet bring them up for us here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse number 2 say, again, it's King James Version. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Remember Hebrews 12 comes from Hebrews chapter 11 where God talked about all what we call the heroes of faith. Those that not only believed in Jesus, but I believed in God, but did everything God said, like Moses, like uh, Abraham, uh, Sarah and others in Hebrews number 11. That's what the, uh, the great cloud of witnesses is that God is talking about. Those that show us that it is it is worthwhile, if you will, to serve God. OK, now God says, since we know about all these people as good examples to us. Let's lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. That means live the Christian life without hypocrisy and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In other words, let us keep our faith. Let us continue to obey God with patience. Patience means to endure. That means the Christian race is going to have some hard times. It's going to have some easy times. But at the same time, we've got to stay faithful to Jesus no matter what. Okay. And it also says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, it's showing the superiority of Jesus over every other man. He taught us how to truly be faithful to the father because remember Jesus was perfect in all things. He never sinned. Okay. And you know that from Hebrews four, verse 14 and verse number 16. Now here's how you deal with hardship and hard times as Jesus did. Uh, the next part of the verse shows you how to do that uh, because he was our example of how to suffer, but stay faithful to God anyway. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. In other words, Jesus knew full well what he was going to go through. He knew about the nails that are going to be put in his hands and his feet. He knew that people were going to spit on him. Uh, he knew that people were going to beat him. He knew that Pilate was, people were going to beat him with a whip. He knew all this stuff. And he knew how bad it was going to hurt and, you know, all this type of things. But he went through with it anyway. Why? Because that's what the father wanted. And of course, we know from later scriptures, the other reason being that he loved all of us. And he knew that's that what it that was what it took, you know, him dying on the cross of Calvary, all this pain that he had to endure uh, so that we could have eternal life. But it was also a third reason. Think about this now. Jesus went to the cross for three reasons. OK, because he was told to by the father. He obeyed the father. That's what it means to be the author and finisher of our faith it means to be faithful to the father. He also said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That means that he died for us. Okay. And the third reason, a lot of people don't look at this, that he knew that there was joy after the cross. In other words, he knew that God was going to raise him from the dead. He knew he was going to ascend into heaven. He knew that he was going to be back sitting down next to the father God. He would be re reunited with his father. And he knew that there was going to be joy there beyond what a person can experience here on earth. So his hardship was made less, if you will, by the hope of joy that was to come. So it's the same thing with us. You know, though our bodies may be racked with pain, you know, I was in a lot of, I've been in a lot of pain for four days now, but I know at some point there's going to be a point where I'm going to put this body down and pick up a building not made with hands, as Paul would say, right? And where it'll be in like Revelation 21, verse number four, there'll be no more crying, dying, pain, no sorrow. God is going to wipe away all tears from the saints' eyes. So there's going to be a day that I'll no longer need medication. You'll no longer need medication. You'll no longer suffer in any way. So that's the joy you look forward to. That gives you the strength, the ability, and the hope to endure what you're going through right now, just like Jesus did on the cross. Okay, so he's teaching us how to look past the pain and look to the joy instead, to look past the now, to look to the future, where these things will not exist any further. That's what verse 2 is talking about, okay, as an example unto us. So let me read it all the way through. In Hebrews 12, verse number two says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, so let's continue on here. All right, so we're still studying and going back to John chapter eight, verse number 54, 55, excuse me, as we get closer to a close. Now, this obedience to the commandments of the Father, as given to us from Jesus Christ, causes us to truly know the Father as well. Remember, we've been talking about 
how Jesus has an intimate relationship with the, with, uh, the Father God. We too have a close relationship with the Father God when we obey his commandments. You see, we do not have a relationship with the Father without obedience to his commandments. That's what the Old and New Testament talks about. God has never changed about that. When we live in rebellion, you know, when we're living out there in sin and won't repent, meaning to change, then we have severed that relationship. We no longer have it. That's what Isaiah 59 verse 2 tells us in 1 Peter 3 verse number 12 also shows us. You see, to truly know and love God is to keep his commandments, which you'll know from John 14, 15 and 1 John chapter 5 verse number 3. Let me show you that as well out of the scriptures in and of itself. See, again, the scriptures say, John chapter 14, verse number 15. And this is Jesus talking to us. He says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. First John chapter 5, verse number 3. You'll find out that keeping the commandments of Jesus is keeping the commandments of God. Because remember, Jesus speaks to us. I mean, God the Father speaks to us through Jesus. So it's the same thing. So first John 5, verse number 3 says the same thing. For this is the love of God. In other words, how we love God as people. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. In other words, his commandments are not a burden. We we should want to obey God because he's so good to us, uh, because he always has our best interests in mind. And at the end of the day, you know, when we take our last breath, we go on to paradise, and then the second coming, uh, we go on to heaven, it's going to be all worth it in, in the end. Okay? All right. So let's move on. All right, verse 56. Now we're back in John chapter number 8. John chapter 8, verse 56. Uh, and this is Jesus again speaking to the audience of unbelievers. He says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, again, somewhere in Abraham's life, he was told by God that the Messiah would come. So we're going back to the book of Genesis. Keep in mind that God said Abraham saw the arrival of Moses, of the Messiah. Now look at that. That makes a big difference. Remember, Messiah means the Lord and Savior, meaning Jesus. God just said he's, that Abraham saw the Messiah. Okay, that's big. That's a huge, big deal. Okay? Because remember, Abraham has been dead for, th for hundreds, if not thousands of years before Jesus was born. So how in the world could Abraham have saw Jesus? Hmm. Well, what did we talk about earlier? Abraham is still alive. Huh? All the dead are still alive. And so Abraham, you know, was able to see, though he had been deceased for a long time, Jesus come. Okay? All right. So that can only mean that Abraham's soul is still alive. How this is done, I cannot tell you. No man can tell you. These are the things of God. This is beyond man's comprehension how Abraham could have done this. But God has said that he has seen him. So and not only did Abraham see Jesus, the Bible says he rejoiced to see Jesus come to the earth. This is proof that mankind lives on after earthly death. Folks, if Abraham lives on, we live on. We exist beyond the grave, folks. Our souls live on. On. This is further proof from what Jesus is teaching us that that is nothing but the truth and all and nothing but the truth. OK. All right. So going down to verse 57 to 59. These are going to be our concluding verses for the evening. Uh, Lord wills. The Bible says again in the King James Version, John chapter 8, verse 59, 57 to 59. It says, then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old and hast thou seen Abraham, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. A miracle just happened. He didn't catch it. I'll show you what miracle just happened. Now, again, these verses are showing us. The unbelievers did not believe Jesus had, had ever seen Abraham, because Abraham had been dead for centuries, and the Lord was still a young man. That's basically what they're saying. Okay, in John chapter 8, verse 56 and 57. However, Jesus made it clear that it was entirely possible for him to see Abraham because he righteously claimed he lived before Abraham, which we know. Because why? Remember, Jesus was divine. He existed before Abraham was born, existed before Abraham, before 
Adam and Eve were even created. So obviously then, he's able to see down time all the way to the end of the world. Everybody, he sees everybody. And that's one reason why he's able to be a judge of all mankind, because he can see everything that we do. Okay? All right? So again, when he said that before Abraham was, I am, the unbelievers knew exactly what that statement meant, and it infuriated them. It made them, as we like to say, hot under the collar. They were fuming angry at this time, fuming mad, as we like to say. They knew Jesus was saying that he was divine, okay? And this is why the audience picked up stones to kill him, okay? They could not fathom, you know, they could not wrap, as we like to say, wrap their head around the idea of any man putting himself on the same level of divinity as God the Father, which Jesus just did. Because obviously, Jesus just said, before Abraham was, I am. The only other person that ever said, I am, was the one that spoke at the burning bush back in the days of Genesis, right? When when Moses said, who shall I tell the people I uh, that you are? What is your name, in other words? Remember what God the Father said to him at the burning bush. He said, I am that I am. That means I am. So Jesus used a divine statement to describe himself. That's why he said before Abraham was, which also tells you that he said, I'm divine because he lived before Abraham. Even though Abraham was born hundreds of years before him, the only way that you can be that is if you, is if you are divine, right? And then he said, I am after that, which immediately brought them back to the thought of God saying in Genesis, I am that I am. So again, and I'm going to repeat myself on purpose. The unbelievers knew what this statement meant. They knew Jesus was saying he was divine. This is why they picked up stones to kill him. They could not fathom any man putting himself on the same level of divinity as God the Father. As we see in verse number 58 of John chapter number 8. All right, nonetheless, now here's where a miracle happened. Remember, Jesus is with a crowd of people that want to kill him, okay? Now, Jesus was able to fade into the crowd and walk past all of them miraculously because the Father would not let him die by stoning or before his appointed time. Can anybody tell me why Jesus could not die by stoning, huh? Why did they have no power to kill Jesus, even though they planned to kill him right there on the spot? Hmm? Well, your answer is, is because God said that Jesus would die by crucifixion. Remember, whenever God the Father has a plan, that plan cannot be broken. Okay? Thus, no one can kill the Lord before the appointed time of crucifixion in order for the Lord to die for our sins according to the plan of Almighty God. Remember, and I'm highly simpli simpli uh, simplifying the plan of God. Remember, the plan of God is in Psalm 22, where the Son of God was to be crucified, literally, on a cross. Okay? Isaiah 53 also is a plan of God, where the Bible says that he would be bruised, he would be beaten, and he would die for us. Okay? And Acts chapter number 2 talks about the fulfillment of, of Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and other passages of Scripture, Psalm um, chapter 16, verse 8 to verse number 11, where Jesus is told to uh, get up before it even happens, right? So all of these were the plan of God, that he would suffer, die, and rise again, but he would suffer in a certain way, that he would be beaten, Isaiah 53, and that he would be crucified, Psalm chapter number 22, and that he would rise from the dead, Psalm chapter 16, not be killed by stoning. So that means that these people, even though they would have outnumbered Jesus, even though they would have had more firepower, if you will, I'm talking about the stones that they picked up, they had no power at all because God the Father was there stopping them from being able to hurt Jesus. So that means a miracle just occurred. Otherwise, Jesus would have never made it out of there alive. But the Father was on his side. So I tell you how powerful the Father is. That's why the Bible can say, no weapon formed against me can, shall prosper. So when God has a plan for you, there's nothing people can do, no matter how much they try to sabotage you. At the end of the day, even if they delay you a little bit, God, the Father's plan for you is going to go forward, no matter what, because nobody can overpower God himself. So again, going back to this miracle of John chapter 8, verse 57 and verse number 59. Jesus was able to fade into the crowd and walk past all of them miraculously 
Because again, the father would not let him die by stoning or before his appointed time, which it wasn't his time either. Okay, He was destined to die by crucifixion. So again, no one could kill the Lord before the appointed time of crucifixion in order for the Lord to die for our sins according to the plan of Almighty God. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and we'll end here. Again, we thank you for joining us here at the Henry Street Church of Christ uh, Bible class. Though I'm calling it Wednesday night Bible class, that's our typical time, though it's Thursday. But again, because of issues yesterday, we're not able to meet. We were hindered yesterday, but we made it up today on Thursday night instead. So again, I invite you out. We plan to go back to Wednesdays once again, uh, every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time. Join us here at the Henry Street Church of Christ Virtual Bible Study. But also, again, we invite you out to join us on Sundays at, nine, uh, at, at 10 a.m., that is, worship starts. Uh, but we do encourage you to come at 9.30 a.m. on Sundays because, again, we're taking all of our safety protocols to make sure we're not spreading the uh, coronavirus at all, okay? So we meet earlier at 9.30 to get prepared for worship. We take temperatures before we get in the building and make sure everybody's spread out. And then we start Bible, uh, start worship at 10 a.m. Central Time. Again, so that's, that's on every Sunday morning. Uh, we encourage you to come at 309 Henry Street in the city of Gaston, Alabama. Uh, 35901 is our zip code. And of course, you can find us easier uh, via the internet at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. Um, and you'll find our address and other information about the uh, church uh, that meets there at Henry Street in Gaston, Alabama. But also want to let you know the plan of salvation. Uh, for those that are members of the Lord's uh, church, remember this so you can share it to, with other people. But for those that don't know the Lord are not Christians yet, make sure you listen and listen closely because this is the best thing that could ever happen to you to have eternal life. As Jesus said in John 14, verse 1 and verse number 2, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and John chapter uh, 14, verse 6 tells us how special Jesus is. That the Bible tells us that he is the way, the only way to heaven. In other words, there's no salvation without being a Christian first, okay? So in order to become a Christian, which means to obey the plan of salvation, uh, is It begins in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. There's six steps. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Step two of the plan of salvation is about the faith you must have, your belief that Jesus Christ is the son of God. It says in John chapter three, verse number 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, you have to believe not only not only believe that he's the son of God, must take on the Christian lifestyle. It's called repentance. That means you're turning away from a sinful lifestyle to leave to live one that is pleasing, acceptable unto God in righteousness. You see that in Luke 13, verse 3 and verse number 5, Acts 2, verse 38. Another passage of scripture uh, that tells us that we must repent, that is, take on a Christian life before God will forgive us of our sins, leading to salvation. Uh, the fourth part of the plan of salvation is confession. Romans 10, verse 9, and verse number 10 talks about how we must confess Jesus as Lord, meaning the Son of God, to be saved. And of course, we must go down in the water grave of baptism, where we go down our old self in the water, but rise a new creation where all our statuses with God are completely changed. Uh, the first status is that we'll be changed from sinner to saint. We'll be changed from a, uh, a person that's not in a relationship with God to one that has an intimate relationship with God as a child of God. And you'll see that in Acts 22, verse number 16, where the cleansing happens. In other words, that's when you come in contact with the blood. In Acts 22, verse number 16, it says, Why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, the other part of your status that changes, as mentioned earlier, is you go from uh, a person that's not in the family of God to one that's in the family of God. That's called being in the Christ, also known as being in the body. You see that in Galatians 3, verse 27, the Bible says that those who have been baptized have been baptized into Christ. And then, of course, uh, the most obvious thing that happens when you're baptized is in Mark 16, verse 16. That is, you go from unsaved to saved. That's why Jesus said in Mark 16, verse number 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So after that, get out of the watery grave of baptism rejoicing. 
because all your sins will be washed away. You have been added to the body of Christ, meaning you're a child of God, also known as a Christian, and you'll be saved if you stay faithful unto death. Remember what Jesus always tells us in Revelation 2, verse number 10, after you become a Christian. He says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That is, stay faithful to Jesus unto death. Let's keep believing and obeying to the end, and heaven's going to be your home. If you're not a child of God, I mean, if you're a child of God, that is, and you've fallen uh, into a disorderly orderly status with God, remember, grace and mercy is still there with you. Uh, you can be restored to God's fold of peace. Uh, and salvation again by repentance, confession, and, and prayer. According to Acts 8, verse 22, and 1 John 1, 7, and verse uh, number 10. And don't forget again, our YouTube site, just go uh, type in my name, Anthony L. Norwood, uh, which comes up as uh, Jesus is Lord, is my name on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel to get the latest updates to the videos, and you'll get the uh, daily inspirations that we send out, a daily devotional called One Minute Inspirations every day. And also you'll be able to get the uh, Wednesday night Bible class as well as the worship services on Sunday as we also post them to YouTube as well within uh, 24 hours. So share these things with uh, others. You know, at the touch of a button now, you can share via YouTube which very, very, as well as Facebook for so that others can be saved and other Christians be strengthened and encouraged through your own just a little electronic ministry. That only takes a couple minutes uh, for you to implement and do in your life. But of course, if you're not in the body of Christ, you're not become a Christian, seek out the local Church of Christ congregation. We're pretty much everywhere. Uh, I see three different regions on the phone here. I mean, excuse, excuse me, on the uh, video tonight. I see Nigeria there. I see the city of Uyo, Akwaibom uh, State, Nigeria. On. Uh, there's a good church there. It's called the Church of Christ that meets at the Nigerian Christian Institute campus. So look up Nigerian Christian Institute and they'll, they'll embrace you and allow you to uh, worship there. I worship there myself. I try to go there annually as the good Lord sees fit. So another place that's dear to my heart. I saw some of the people from Mount Clemens, Michigan, my hometown in the United States. Good church there, 260 North Broadway called North Broadway Church of Christ. Uh, go there on the north side of town, northeast side of town. And Amir Bracken, the fine preacher there, contact him. He'll take your confession and baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins. And, of course, the Henry Street Church of Christ here in Northeast Alabama. Come on down and uh, we'll take your confession and baptize you also for the forgiveness of your sins and salvation of your soul. May God bless you all. We'll go on and uh, we'll end things tonight. Again, we'll see you next Wednesday right here on Facebook Live uh, at 7 p.m. Central Time if the good Lord sees fit. God bless you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.